will to give all women the right to vote in 1893. I'm part of the most diverse and inclusive parliament New Zealanders have ever elected, with women making up 48% of our parliament and 55% of my party and government. Women also hold the top posts of Governor General, Prime Minister, Leader of the Opposition and Chief Justice, and increasingly are holding senior roles in our public service and business sector. And now, for the first time, and long overdue, I might add, New Zealand's Minister of Foreign Affairs is a woman. She's a skilled, values-driven, indigenous woman with a contemporary worldview. And yet for all of that, we have so much more to do. Because it doesn't matter how many women are in leadership, so long as we have women overrepresented in job loss and low-paid work and domestic violence statistics. In my mind, that is the true measure of whether we have made progress and whether we have equality. As we look towards the year ahead, we all know it will be tough. There will be big challenges and demands made of all of us as leaders. We will be tested, but we must resist the false promises in the face of those tests of protectionism, of nationalism, and our recovery from COVID-19. We must all do more to support women-led business, including small enterprises, to be part of the COVID-19 economic recovery so they can more readily experience the benefits of trade. The European Union and New Zealand, we are like-minded partners with so many values and interests in common. We both desire the stability and freedoms afforded us all by global rules and institutions, free and open markets, and a world where human rights are valued and prioritised. As we all turn towards creating a sustainable global economic recovery, my message to you is simple. We need to stick together because we are all in this together. He waka e kanoa. I wish your parliament and all our people the very best for the challenges that lie ahead. Noho ora mai, stay safe, stay well. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Tiene tato katoa. Grazie, grazie alla prima ministra Ardner. E adesso il messaggio della vicepresidente degli Stati Uniti, Kamala Harris. Prego. President David Sassoli, members of the European Parliament, it is an honor to address this esteemed institution on this important day, International Women's Day. Let me begin by saying that President Joe Biden and I look forward to working with members of this parliament and fortifying the transatlantic alliance. Today, we face crises on almost every front, a pandemic that has taken the lives of more than two and a half million people worldwide. A changing climate threatens the future of our Earth. A rise in populism is working to undercut democracies everywhere. Neither the United States nor Europe is immune from these threats. Today, it is essential that we work together to advance those principles that strengthen democracies, accountability and transparency, the rule of law and human rights. And let us not overlook the opportunities right in front of us to do that. We know that the strength of our democracies and the strength of every nation on earth depends on the strength of all people. As half of the world's population, women drive major economic growth and major contributions to society. They are scientists who cure disease and the military members who defend our nations. They are entrepreneurs who create jobs and the educators who shape the next generation. And of course, women are government leaders from this parliament's first elected president, Simone Weil, to all the women leaders who sit among you today. Today, the global crises we now face have made abundantly clear both the contributions of women and the challenges facing women. Simply put, our world does not yet work for women as it should. COVID-19 has threatened the health the economic security, and the physical security of women everywhere. The pandemic has overloaded health care systems, making it even harder 
for women to access the care they need. At the same time, women comprise 70% of the global health workforce, putting them on the front lines and at risk of contracting the virus. Other women have been forced out of the workforce entirely. Women working in often overlooked sectors have been hit the hardest, especially those working in low-wage jobs and those working in the informal economy. Last year, it was reported that globally nearly three in four domestic workers lost their jobs. And those who remain employed, well, they're paid far too little. Meanwhile, quarantine measures have meant that women have shouldered an increased burden at home as they care for children day and night. Time in isolation has also increased the risk of gender-based violence while interfering with services for survivors of domestic violence. I understand that last May this parliament opened the Helmut Kohl building so that some of these survivors might have a safe place to sleep. I have spent much of my career protecting survivors of domestic violence and child abuse, and I applaud your generosity. As we endure the pandemic, the economic instability, the racial injustice, the threats to democracy, and the effects of climate change, the question before us is simple. How do we build a world that works for women? I believe we must ensure women's safety at home and in every community. We must ensure that women can access high-quality health care and that those health needs particular to women are addressed. We must treat women with dignity at work and put in place the structures needed so that women can both care for their families and excel in the workforce. Finally, we must give women equal voice in decision-making, for this is essential to free and fair democracies. And this is not just an act of goodwill. This is a show of strength. If we build a world that works for women, our nations will all be safer, stronger, and more prosperous. This International Women's Day, let us be determined in this effort. Let us be united in this effort. I thank you, President Biden, and I look forward to working with you. Grazie. Grazie alla vicepresidente Harris. Adesso do la parola alla presidente von der Leyen, presidente della Commissione europea. Prego. The fee, the, I think now it's on. So, my fellow European women, let's have a look at what women have endured in 12 months of pandemic. The female doctors and nurses working double shifts for entire weeks and months. The women entrepreneurs who fought back, reinvented their business and pulled out all the stops to save their employees. The mothers of lockdown children who've had to learn the toughest and most amazing job in the world with no support from the outside world. Look at Vice President Kamala Harris. Look at Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern and what they've done for their country. Look at their grace, professionalism, compassion and resolve. Look at all these amazing women in our families and communities and think again, this day is for them. For the women on the front line and the women in the back office, to the business women and the volunteers, to the mothers, to the daughters, to the unsung heroes of this pandemic, this is your day and this is my thank you to all of you. On Women's Day, I want all European women to know that Europe, it is at their side. I am on your side. I want Europe to finally become a continent 
of equal opportunities for men and women. And I know we are not there yet. I know the playing field is not level yet. I know from experience that women have to work twice as hard to get the same salary, the same recognition, or the same leadership position as their male colleagues. I know the obstacles and the prejudices. And therefore, I'm proud that last week the Commission presented two proposals to address two of the great injustices that women still face. The gender pay gap and the gender employment gap. Women in Europe are paid on average 14% less than men. This is simply not right. So we are proposing a European directive for pay transparency. It is built on two simple principles. Equal work deserves equal pay, and for equal pay, you need transparency. And women must know whether their employees, employers treat them fairly, and when this is not the case, they must have the power to fight back and get what they deserve. And there's more to do. Too many women in Europe lack a very fundamental opportunity. The opportunity to work and to earn a living. Today, the employment rate for women is 67%, while that of men is 78%. And this is simply not acceptable. So last week, we have set a new target for Europe. We must cut the gender employment gap in half. And by the end of this decade, 78% of all must have a job. It won't be easy, but I can promise that we will do all in our power to work towards this goal. We will strengthen childcare, because no women or men should have to choose between being a mother or father or having a career. We will strengthen elderly care. We will invest in quality education for girls and women. We will push former women in leadership positions in public and private bodies across all economic sectors. And we have required that all member states put women at the center of their recovery plans. It will only be a true recovery if these plans are for all. Honorable members, let me quote Vice President Harris and adapt her words to Europe. We must show every child in Europe that there are no limits to who can lead and help position of power in our union, regardless of color or gender. Vice President Harris and Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, we are in this together, indeed. Equality is enshrined in the European Treaty since 1957. It's been a long road, and we will keep walking. We have to remove the obstacles on the path towards equality. We have to strive for equal opportunities. It is no rocket science. The necessary tools are well known and proven. We just have to implement them and do it. Long live Europe and happy Women's Day. Grazie, grazie al Presidente von der Leyen. Rimuovere gli ostacoli è stato detto da tutti in questa giornata che non vuole essere retorica, ma una giornata di impegno. Di impegno perché effettivamente l'Europa sia capace di dare il segno di una vera parità. E credo che questa sia la conclusione di questa celebrazione. Ringrazio tutti per avervi partecipato. Grazie. È con profonda tristezza che abbiamo appreso nei giorni scorsi dell'assassinio dell'ambasciatore italiano della Repubblica, nella De Repubblica Democratica del Congo. Luca Tanasio è stato ucciso insieme al carabiniere Vittorio Iacovacci, all'autista Mustafa Milambo, 
il 22 febbraio scorso vicino a Goma mentre facevano parte di un convoglio del programma alimentare mondiale degli Stati Uniti. Il Parlamento europeo dedicherà un dibattito in questa sessione eh, giovedì prossimo a tutto questo, ma vorrei iniziare la nostra sessione plenaria inviando le nostre più profonde condoglianze alle famiglie, alle vittime, ai loro cari. I nostri pensieri sono con loro, con tutte le vittime della violenza. E vi prego di unirvi a me in un minuto di silenzio. Grazie. Grazie. Dichiaro ripresa la sessione del Parlamento europeo che si è interrotta l'11 febbraio scorso. Vorrei informare l'Aula che ho ricevuto una mozione di procedura da parte dell'onorevole Cubilius e a cui do la parola. Prego, onorevole. Sì, sì, parli anche da lì. Sì, sì. Ok. Ok. Dear colleagues, Mr. President, our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and Crimea, I'm speaking on behalf of all of us. I'm speaking to all of you and ask you to commemorate a very sad event in recent history of the European continent. Seven years ago, exactly on those days, at the beginning of March, Kremlin authorities were finalizing occupation of Crimea. They occupied this beautiful part of Ukraine simply because people of Ukraine decided to move closer to the European Union. That was how the most brutal international crime on the European continent after the Second World War was committed. We Europeans, neighbors and friends of Ukraine, were only able to observe this crime with sincere pain. Since then, the European Parliament on all the occasions was very clear in its non-recognition of Crimea occupation policy. The European Parliament also is very clear in its solidarity with indigenous Tatar and Ukrainian people who are suffering very hard conditions of occupational regime. Permanent human rights violations, political persecutions are what many of Crimea people are living through. Let me stress, I am absolutely sure, despite our political or regional differences, the European Parliament will stay strong on non-recognition policy and on solidarity with the people who are suffering because of occupation. Our solidarity was very clear when Sakharov Prize two years ago was awarded to one of the victims of Crimea occupation, to the famous filmmaker Oleg Sentsov. And I can remind, remind Kremlin authorities that the Western non-recognition policy is a very powerful instrument. For 50 years, from 1940s till 1990s, Lithuania and other Baltic states were occupied by the Soviet Union. And all that time, US and Western U Europe were non-recognizing our occupation. And because of that permanent policy, we regained at the end our freedom. The same will happen with the occupation of Crimea. We shall never recognize this occupation. We shall keep our solidarity with Crimea people and people of Ukraine, and at the end, Crimea will become free again. Slava Ukraine. Grazie, grazie, onorevole Kubilius. Ha chiesto di intervenire anche l'onorevole Cancò. Prego, onorevole. Grazie. 
Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. I would like to uh, draw your attention today on uh, the murder of David Paul Fleet in Belgium. He was 41 years old. He has been trapped by uh, young boys who um, aggressed him and killed him because he is gay. So I'm using this opportunity to say that love is love and nobody should die for who you are. Please join me in sharing the pain of his family and wishing for more justice inside our member states. Thank you very much. Grazie, onorevole Cancò, per averci ricordato questa tragedia. Il processo verbale e i testi approvati delle sedute 8, 9, 10 e 11 febbraio sono stati distribuiti. Vi sono osservazioni? Se non vi sono osservazioni, il processo verbale è approvato. Ha chiesto di intervenire l'onorevole Ponsati. Uh, per fatto personale, onorevole, le ricordo che il regolamento del Parlamento prevede che l'oratore non possa intervenire sull'argomento della discussione, ma deve limitare a respingere affermazioni fatte nel corso della discussione con riferimento alla sua persona o a opinioni che gli sono state attribuite, oppure a rettificare proprie dichiarazioni precedenti. Il regolamento prevede inoltre che il deputato possa chiedere di parlare per fatto personale al momento dell'approvazione del processo verbale della seduta a cui si riferisce la richiesta di intervento. La sua richiesta deve quindi riferirsi ad affermazioni fatte con riferimento alla sua persona o a opinioni che le sono state attribuite nella tornata di febbraio. La parola, prego onorevole.